Hello, on behalf of Department of English, North Odisha University, I welcome all our viewers to our international webinar series titled Gandhi's Legacies, Reflections and Reappraisals. We are deeply honored to have as our speaker, uh, eminent historian and author, Professor Vinay Lal, uh, who teaches history at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, I'll very quickly introduce Professor Lal uh, before uh, he begins with his presentation. Uh, the talk will be followed by Q&A. Although Professor Lal barely needs any introduction, but for our young viewers and for those who are curious about his upcoming works, I'll very quickly introduce Professor Lal. Professor Vinay Lal is Professor of History and Asian American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He earned his PhD with distinction from the University of Chicago in 1992 after undergraduate and master degrees in literature and philosophy from Johns Hopkins University. He writes on a wide range of topics which include Indian history, historiography, public and popular culture in India, the Indian diaspora, colonialism, human rights, the architecture of nonviolence, Gandhi, of course, all of us know Professor Lal as a renowned authority on Gandhi and his works. And the globe, uh, he has also worked on the global politics of knowledge systems. His books include the two volume Oxford Anthology of Modern Indian City, published by OUP in 2013, Political Hinduism, the Religious Imagination in Public Spheres, OUP 2009, The Future of Knowledge and Culture, a dictionary for the 21st century. This is a co volume co-edited with Ashish Nandi and published by uh, Viking Penguin in 2005. Of Cricket, Guinness and Gandhi, Essays on Indian History and Culture, 2005 Penguin. The History of History, Politics and Scholarship in Modern India, OUP 2003. Empire of Knowledge, Culture and Plurality in the Global Economy, Pluto Press, 2002. And most recently is the author of India and Civilizational Futures, Backwaters Collectives on Metaphysics and Politics, Oxford 2019, and A Passionate Life Writings by and on Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, published by Zuban Books in 2017. Uh, this is uh, a co-edited volume, which uh, Professor Lyle co-edited with Ellen Carroll Dubois. Uh, his book, the, Fu the Fury of COVID-19, The Passion's Journey and the Unrequited Love of the Coronavirus, will be published by Mac Pan Macmillan, I presume, in later this month, October 2020. His scholarly work has been translated into Hindi, Urdu, Kannada, French, German, Spanish, Finnish, Korean, and Persian. And his shorted essays and popular writings have been translated into some 40 languages, including languages, I beg your pardon, including Portuguese, Estonian, Ukrainian, Slovak, Russian, Bosnian, Polish, Albanian, Greek, Indonesian, and Thai. Works in progress include a book on the history of colonial India through stories, a study of internet Hinduism, and two books on Indian nationalism and visual imaginary. A two volume collection of his essays on Gandhi will be published by Orient Black Swan in mid 2021. He also has the distinction of being listed among uh, the, and I quote, 101 most dangerous professors in America, unquote, in David Horowitz's book, The Professors, quite likely the only 15 minutes of fame he will ever have in his life. That's how he would like to put it very modestly. He blogs at vinaylal.wordpress.com, which is very popular, especially among young students of humanities who often uh, read his uh, writing, his short pieces that appear in, on his blog. And he maintains an academic YouTube channel at youtube.com, uh, uh, which of course a lot of students uh, view from time to time. It, it, it so far has at least 200 million views. He also blogs at avplife.in. Besides, uh, as we all know, Professor Lal also publishes on several uh, popular magazines in India and elsewhere. Today, uh, Professor Lal has very kindly agreed to speak to us on a very important and on a very rare subject. Uh, and the topic is very interestingly called on anarchism and radical nonviolence. So without further ado, I request <coughs> Professor to begin with his presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Shashwat, uh, for the very generous and lengthy introduction. Uh, and greetings to uh, all of you who have uh, logged in, wherever you may be. 
So um, I would like to uh, begin with the title of the talk and explain the structure uh, of my remarks today. Um, I also want to add that, uh, you know, in the few minutes of the introduction, there were already two or three occasions when uh, for several seconds I couldn't hear uh, uh, Shashwat at all. Uh, so, you know, there may be a few uh, places where perhaps what I'm saying may not be clear simply because the connection may not be very good. And if that's the case, you know, please be sure to ask me for a clarification uh, later on uh, if, if something uh, could not be heard properly. Uh, so the lecture, so the webinar today is called uh, on radical nonviolence and anarchism, Gandhi, Tolstoy, and the Dukobors. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to structure this talk in several parts. The first is to offer some general remarks uh, by way of an intellectual framework. Um, Secondly, uh, I'm going to turn to what I call the other Tolstoy. And the third part is the exchange between Tolstoy and Gandhi. Uh, and both, both parts two and three will also suggest what might have been shared between Tolstoy and Gandhi. And then in the concluding part, uh, I will talk about a group of people known as the Dukobors and suggest where they come into the picture. And then once I've concluded with these four parts, I will then offer some concluding reflections. So uh, the first uh, thing that I want to bring to everyone's attention is that Tolstoy has been mentioned uh, frequently in studies of Gandhi. But it is necessary to say that this intellectual exchange between the two uh, and remarks that have been offered by various scholars, there's, there's something asymmetrical about it, uh, by which I mean that Gandhi scholars are very well aware of uh, the place that Tolstoy occupied in his life. Uh, but if you look at Tolstoy scholars, and I have to say right away that I don't read Russian, so I, I might not know the bulk uh, of the Tolstoy scholarship, although I think as some of you will recognize the Tolstoy scholarship even in English is actually enormous. Um, and of course, I don't know most of it. I, I certainly don't know the very detailed studies that have been done of his novels, um, because that's not really an area that I really work in. I mean, I've read the novels, some of the major ones, uh, but I'm not really familiar with, with the entire Tolstoy scholarship, of course. Uh, so, so really, when I say that the, that the, that the attention is asymmetrical, uh, perhaps I may be mistaken, but I don't think so, because I've certainly looked at biographies of Tolstoy written in English, uh, and the vast majority of them uh, give Gandhi only really a passing mention, right? Uh, and I think that this is actually a mistake. That is, that this is a profound misunderstanding on the part of Tolstoy scholars as well as to the significance of Gandhi um, um, uh, in being able to appreciate what it is that Tolstoy, the later Tolstoy, really uh, stood for. Um, secondly, uh, and this is all by way of a, as I said, some general remarks uh, that offer an intellectual framework. Uh, it is necessary to say that the that the that the the uh, language in which this relationship is usually described is one that I want to disavow. Now, in other words, what I mean by that is that most scholars, Gandhi scholars, speak of what we might describe as Tolstoy's influence on Gandhi. Now, the word influence is a word that does not really have much analytical purchase. Um, and by that, I mean that, you know, the word lends itself to enormous elasticity, enormous elasticity. What does it really mean when we say that, that Gandhi was uh, influenced by Tolstoy? Was he moved by him? Was he inspired by him? Uh, did he read something and then therefore he borrowed an idea or two? Uh, did Tolstoy leave a lasting impression on? And they, these are all the considerations that, that, that to my mind come uh, with thinking about something called influence, which as I said, is a very elastic idea. Uh, and I don't mean by, and I don't mean to say that there isn't a common sense sort of view of what we mean by influence. But I'm saying that it's not an analytically very sharp idea that we can play around with it, it appears to me, you know, right? 
Um, thirdly, it has been remarked by a number of scholars working on Gandhi uh, and by influential public intellectuals in India that, that uh, Gandhi's gurus were all really Western, the principal gurus. Uh, and, 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 and here the references to uh, uh, John Ruskin, uh, the English, uh, you know, late 19th century English art critic and social critic, um, uh, Henry David Thoreau, the American essayist, uh, most famous, at least in, in these circles, for an essay uh, called On the Duty of Civil Disobedience, and also, of course, for his majestic book called Walden, um, you know, which is a record of two years of his life spent in the woods, as it were. Um, and thirdly, of course, Tolstoy, right, that these are the three major gurus, according to this view of things. Um, and of course, I think the scholars who say that uh, recognize that uh, that Gandhi also acknowledged people like Gokhale uh, or or his Gujarati contemporary um, uh, Srimad Rajchandra or Raichand Bhai, as Gandhi calls him in his in the autobiography, the other name by which he was really known to many people. Uh, and then one could add to that many other people, such as Emerson, for example. You know, uh, Henry David's. Uh, Thoreau's uh, contemporary and mentor of sorts uh, for a while, uh, you know, the founder of what is called American transcendentalism and so on. One can think of many other names. Now, I want to suggest a different way of viewing this question of gurus or influence, because notwithstanding everything that I will say today about Tolstoy and, and uh, his exchange with Gandhi and how one might view the two of them together, uh, I want to suggest that Gandhi would have been Gandhi without any of these people, all right? By this, I don't mean to say that he was destined to be the Mahatma, you know, the, the, a word that he disavowed himself, you know, he, he disavowed the whole uh, uh, idea of Mahatma and everything. Um, but uh, what I do mean to say here is that ultimately, I don't think that that, that uh, any of these people was so critically decisive for Gandhi, notwithstanding even what Gandhi himself says. Because if you read Gandhi, he will tell you that, you know, Gokhale, Emerson, Thoreau, Ruskin, Raichand Bhai, uh, and several other people that he mentions, you know, that he viewed all of them uh, as people who were his gurus, who were his mentors, uh, people who moved him. Uh, but he speaks in the language of piety. You know, he'll say, I met Charlie Andrews. My eyes fell on him for the first time and I immediately came to acquire to love him, you know, right? Uh, there is a language of piety. He's very generous in that sense in acknowledging what, what uh, all of these people really mean for him. Uh, and my suggestion to you, my simple submission to you is that I think Gandhi uh, would, in fact, actually have been Gandhi without any of these people having really entered into his life. That is that there was something there which drove him to be what he became eventually. All right. Uh, but nonetheless, since they are part of his life, it then becomes imperative to understand in what manner they may actually have shaped his life. Uh, we also have to understand that gurus are very possessive. Uh, if a man has 10 different gurus, and uh, all the other gurus, uh, will not countenance that possibility. So, you know, when, when we say that Gandhi had all these multiple gurus, it's a way of saying he had no guru at all. That's really what I mean when I say that he would have been Gandhi with or without these people, you know, right? Now, the other important consideration to moving to a different kind of intellectual argument is why should one be thinking at all about, let's say, Tolstoy, right? Leave, leave, leave aside the framework that I've already portions of the framework that I've already offered. The answer here is that one has to think about the other West, all right? Now, what I mean by that very simply is this, that in studying Gandhi, and I would say more broadly in studying ethics and political philosophy, one should arrive the proposition that freedom is indivisible. Certainly, Gandhi arrived at this proposition. That if I am free, but someone else is free, then I cannot be truly free. 
right? Freedom is indivisible. Now, the implications of this for studying Gandhi and colonialism in India is that I think we have to arrive at the understanding that Gandhi's principal political project, right, in the concrete, and here I'm not speaking about larger abstractions such as, for example, the whole idea of Satya, Ahimsa, Sarvodhya, what, what place they had in his worldview, which is enormous, and a number of other allied concepts as well. But the principal political project in one way can be described as delivering India from colonial rule. Right? And, and, and Gandhi is at the helm of the, what becomes known as a nationalist movement or what in India is called the history of the freedom struggle. Right? But if freedom is indivisible, it also means in this case that the principal political project was not simply delivering India from British rule. It was delivering the English from their own worst tendencies. Because colonialism is a pact between the colonizer and the colonized. And the colonizer are themselves colonized in various ways. It, it, and we can complicate this in many ways because, for example, the colonizers colonize not just the Indians and the Africans and the Malays and so on, right? They also colonized their own people. They colonized their women. They colonized, the English colonized the Scots, the Irish, the Welsh, the working class. Right? And one of the arguments that I think we have to be attentive to is that in many ways, the English homogenized themselves right? in this process of colonizing the other and colonizing themselves. And so therefore, what Gandhi sought to do was to actually free the British now. And here I'm including the Scots and the Irish, because even though they were colonized by the Irish, they in turn also assisted the English in colonizing Indians. Right? So Gandhi's endeavor was not just to free India from British rule. His endeavor was to actually free the English and the British more broadly from their own worst tendencies because those are the grounds for a radical freedom from a Gandhian standpoint. Now, the relationship of this to the other West is this, and this is where Tolstoy really comes into the picture, is that Gandhi offers a critique of Western civilization, but he understands that this is not a monolithic civilization. That is that within the West, there are several trajectories that have become recessive. Right? They have they've been placed in the background. They have withdrawn. That there are dissenting elements within the Western tradition. And even though he has a critique of Western civilization, it is not a critique of Western civilization in toto. It is a critique of Western civilization to the extent that Western civilization is synonymous with modern industrial civilization. But he understands that there are leading intellectuals in the and, and what you might describe as social reformers or activists or thinkers within the West with whom he can actually seek to forge an alliance of some kind, right? Because they understand the conditions under which England itself has become colonized by modern industrial civilization, all right? And this is what can be called the other West. So if you look at this little book he wrote, which I will refer to in greater detail later on, Hind Swaraj, right? usually referred to as a pamphlet. It's a short work written in 1909, first published in early 1910 in Gujarati, in Swaraj. And, and we're all familiar with it in India. I mean, anyone who works on Gandhi knows his work uh, to some degree, right? That if you look at the appendix to this, he gives you a list of what he calls eminent authorities, right? People he, who he, he counsels uh, as people who one should be familiar with, thinkers that one should be familiar with, right? The following books, he says, are recommended for perusal to follow up the study of the foregoing, that is to, to, to understand the entire text of Hind Swaraj, right? And then he gives you 20 titles. Remarkable in this list is that barring two works, 
one by Dada by Nairoji, Poverty and Unbritish Rule in India, and, and R.C. Dutt's Economic History of India. All the other works are by Western writers and thinkers. And the, the list is headed, that list of 20 works is headed by six works. You know, not all of them books, some of them are, are just very short works, but six works by Tolstoy. All right. So, so the reason why Tolstoy is really important for us to think with is when we're working on Gandhi is because I'm suggesting to you that Tolstoy is part of the Tolstoy that Gandhi knew is part of this other West. That is that he belongs to that fabric of Western civilization that Gandhi feels he can seek an alliance with because these writers belonging to the other West are also critical of what, if I may just use a common phrase nowadays, what we might describe as mainstream Western civilization. All right. And lastly, by way of providing the general framework, the, uh, the general template for my remarks, it is important to think about Gandhi's relationship to Christianity and Christian missionaries. Now, this is, of course, a very long subject, subject for an entire lecture to itself and subject for what should really be, you know, book length studies. Surprisingly, there are not very many that have really paid very close attention. I mean, people have talked, obviously, including philosophers and people who have worked on uh, Gandhi and, and uh, his understanding of religiosity, uh, his religious ideas. They've all talked about, of course, uh, the play of Christianity in Gandhi's works, his familiarity with his, with the New Testament, uh, the, 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 the extraordinary high regard that he had for the Sermon on the Mount, for example, um, you know, from Matthew, right? and so on. Right? So that part of the story is known. And for people who have worked on Gandhi's years in South Africa, what is also known is his engagement with missionaries which is really where it begins. His engagement with Christian missionaries begins not in India, where he grew up, uh, um, uh, in Kathiawar and Rajkot and, uh, you know, poor Bandar, where he was born, uh, nor even in London. I mean, he doesn't really have any serious interaction with what one might describe as Christian missionaries. Um, uh, in, in London, all the Christian Missionary Society was headquartered, of course, in London. Uh, but missionary work was, of course, largely outside England. I mean, some people think that there was no missionary work in England itself, which is incorrect. Uh, they, there was plenty of missionary work in, in working class settlements, for example, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in England. Right. Um, but his the history of his engagement with the with these Christian groups and missionaries uh, really begins in South Africa. Um, and of course, it is important to understand in this context that Christian missionaries came to champion him. I mean, I think this is an exceedingly part, important part of the story and nowhere more so uh, than in the United States, uh, where John Hayne Holmes, for example, delivered a sermon, uh, uh, you know, 1919-1920, you know, the, who is the greatest, uh, uh, you know, living man in the world today. Uh, and then Holmes goes on to pronounce that that person is someone called Muandas Karamchand Gandhi. Uh, but there were also a great many other missionaries, uh, E. Stanley Jones, uh, who writes a book called The Christian of the Indian Road, uh, John S. Hoyland, um, uh, who writes the book called The Cross Moves East. What an interesting title. Think about it, right? The Cross Moves East. Uh, of course, uh, some people would, scholars of Christianity would argue, well, Christ was actually an Oriental figure to begin with. I mean, you know, that really should be viewed as an Eastern figure. But I think you get the gist of it that because, because Christ has been associated largely with, you know, Western Christianity, with Western Europe and all of that, uh, that, uh, that, that Hoyland wants to suggest that, well, the true representative of Christianity today is actually a man who's not even a Christian. He's a Hindu and he's in India. And he's more Das Karamchand Gandhi, right? Um, and and subsequently he writes another book called They Saw Gandhi in 1947, um, John S. Hoyland. And there were also a large number of black uh, or African American Christian theologians who became great champions of Gandhi. Right? Now this is important because we're going to see that it is the interpretation of Christianity that really is at stake when we begin to look at Tolstoy. So that brings me to the question of the other Tolstoy. So let 
in this particular fashion. When we think of Tolstoy in general, I mean, if you ask most reasonably well-read, educated people, uh, and if they had read Tolstoy, what they knew of Tolstoy, they would talk about the two great epic novels, right? War and Peace and, of course, Anna Karenina. Uh, but it is a fact that in the late 1870s, Tolstoy experienced a conversion, right? And in this phase of conversion, as it were, so we're talking about the late 1870s, and Tolstoy dies in 1910. And so the last 40 years, we have a very different figure than the Tolstoy of the first 40, 50 years. He's born in 1828. Right? So we can divide, we can segment his life if we want to in this particular fashion. I'm going to suggest some difficulties there as well, that I think that the way in which his life has been segmented here is not entirely acceptable, uh, that there are some difficulties there, but nonetheless, that it is very clear that that when he experiences a kind of religious conversion in the 1870s, we're speaking about um, a rather different man. Now, in thinking about Tolstoy and Gandhi and thinking about the other Tolstoy, let me also suggest to you, first of all, that, that if the argument is going to be, one of the arguments is going to be that there are various ways in which we can bring Tolstoy and Gandhi together, it is also interesting to reflect uh, simply on the fact, which is self-evident, but precisely because it's self-evident, in some ways it escapes attention unless one calls, really thinks of it. That is that Gandhi comes to certain insights through what we might call politics. Uh, Tolstoy comes to these insights through literature. He's largely a literary figure. Right? And he didn't cease to write fiction, by the way, after his conversion in the 1870s. I mean, one of his most famous short stories, The Death of Ivan Illich, and then, of course, his short story on the Kreutzer Sonata. I mean, these are later works. So he continued to write fiction, but even the fiction is of a different tenor at this point, after the religious conversion, than the earlier fiction, all right? In his youth, and when I say his, in his youth, I'm speaking about the 20s and 30s, Tolstoy aspired to be a great writer. Uh, he, he comes, he, he's a person who belongs to one might call an aristocratic lineage. I mean, he has an estate where he has serfs who are working for him. Um, and, and, you know, here it's not, uh, not critical to give you, obviously, the whole intellectual biography, nor do I have uh, the time for that right now, the intellectual biography of, um, of uh, uh, Tolstoy. Um, uh, but it is important to mention here that he pointedly remarks to the fact that the cultured men of his times were indifferent to the phenomenon of war, violence, and conscription. And you know, of course, Russia was ruled by the Tsars, and under the Tsars, there was conscription. So young men had to serve in the military. Um, and when Tolstoy says this, what he's pointing out, and this is back in the 1850s, what he's suggesting is that, that look, I mean, there is a literary track to ambition and to fame and to glory, right? And in fact, if you look at Tolstoy's life and when he was in his 20s and 30s and early 40s, he was really someone who acted like a dandy, right? the man around town, right? I mean, he, he dressed well. Uh, he went to parties. And of course, when his novels, War and Peace and Anna Karenina, were published, I mean, he was the talk of Europe, right? I mean, he was viewed as, you know, one of the greatest literary figures um, in, um, in Europe. Right? So this is, this is the Tolstoy that the West is most comfortable with. All right? Now, I want to suggest that there are ways of seeing the uneasiness that Tolstoy is experiencing with the very world in which he is living. You know, a world of uh, what, what some people would have said was simply a world of bourgeois mediocrity, but, but more pointedly, it's a world of, you know, ballroom dancing and parties uh, and salon talks and all of that, 
all right, where you hobnob with artists and writers and the wealthy, right? But there is a kind of uneasiness that you can begin to see. Entirely accidental that there, the portions in War and Peace where he talks about Napoleon and where he has a long kind of intellectual digression on war and history are the most unforgiving. And that is to say that he's quite harsh about the way in which he really writes about war, all right? And I could give you other instances of this kind, but uh, what I want to point to here is in particular, what happens after his conversion, right? Because that's that's what's going to bring him closer to Gandhi, and that's really the main subject of the talk today. All right. So he's going to write a book called "The Kingdom of God Is Within You," which is first published in 1893. There is an English translation of it published in 1894. Um, a translation by A. Delano, and, and Gandhi receives a copy of this book from a friend uh, in 1894. It is not clear how much Gandhi knew of Tolstoy at this time, but it's interesting that Madame Blavatsky had written very favorably about Tolstoy in her theosophical magazine called Lucifer, a magazine that Gandhi himself was familiar with. We know this from the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. We know this from the biographical works that have been written of Gandhi, particularly his, you know, his years in London. Um, uh, you know, Hunt, for example, has a book on Gandhi's London years and what connection he had with the Theosophists. But that's been commented upon by many people who have worked on Gandhi. Um, because of course, you know, this takes us back to the whole question of the other West. You know, that there's something really odd and bizarre if you think about it, that Gandhi arrives in London uh, and within a period of months, he starts circulating among people who were really viewed as bizarre, as cranks, right? Because they represented the other West. They represented the other West. People, for example, who had embraced vegetarianism. I mean, to get a vegetarian meal in England back then, was very, very difficult. It was back to very difficult even in the 1980s. It wasn't until, you know, uh, immigrants, you know, started coming into England, you know, the empire strikes back, as they say, right? People who had been colonized, you know, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Africans, you know, then they start coming to London, particularly after World War II. And, you know, nine, and, and of course, people from the West Indies, uh, the Windrush generation, as it's called, right? That that the that food began to change in England, but what what I mean when I say it's very bizarre and eccentric is that it's in a way Gandhi goes there and who does he start mixing around with theosophists with vegetarians? He's not interested in what one might describe as the the the, the standard narrative of English intellectual life at that point in time. All right, because all of these people are also people who have grievances with what one might describe as the, the principal strands of Western intellectual thinking with the nature of Western civilization at that point in time, all right? So it is, we, don't, we can't say for certain how much Gandhi really knew about Tolstoy, but he knew something of him. That, that is reasonably certain. Even before he got a copy of this book, the, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, this book has a subtitle, Christianity not as a mystical teaching, but as a new concept of life, right? Now, Tolstoy was playing upon the word new, new concept of life in the subtitle in at least four different ways. The first is, of course, that Christianity was a departure from Roman imperial culture, all right? Secondly, this, the new here signifies the distance between Christian thinking, as Tolstoy understood it, right, and the Russian Empire of the 19th century. And I mean, the mid 19th century, when Tolstoy is at, at the helm of his literary powers in some respects, I mean, Russia is an empire, all right? Um, and thirdly, 
and similarly, the, the word new here also signifies the distance between Christian thinking and modern industrial civilization. And in the case of Russia, that's very complicated because we would have to make a distinction between Muscovite Russia, the Russia which really in some ways was viewed by Enlightenment thinkers as kind of backwards, Slavic, completely Slavic, animal-like almost. I mean, I, that might sound very odd to you. That's not my phrase because you'd be astonished to know that the great Enlightenment thinkers, uh, you know, treated all of Eastern Europe and Russia with absolute contempt, you know, uh, the, uh, for a number of reasons. All right. Um, and, and so you make a distinction between between the Russia which is Muscovite, based, you know, in Moscow, as it were, and then the Russia of St. Petersburg, which was the part that was supposed to be more progressive and so on. All right. Okay. And fourthly, the new hair signifies in the subtitle the distinction between institutional Christianity and the teachings of Christ. And that takes us to the essence of Tolstoy's book. All right, and why Gandhi became so interested in Tolstoy. Let me elaborate on this point in greater detail. Tolstoy refers in this book to the Quakers as his spiritual ancestors. I just want to mention that as a little footnote because uh, the Dukovors, to whom I'll turn to at the very end, have sometimes been viewed as kind of the Russian strand of the Quaker religion in a way. All right. Um, and, and of course, uh, some of Gandhi's greatest supporters uh, among the English were Quakers. Uh, so, you know, there's a long and very interesting history of how the Quakers come into all of this. And people who worked on Tolstoy and Gandhi have not at all picked up on the Quaker link, if I may put it this way, all right, between the two, all right? But he refers to, in this book, to the Quakers as his spiritual ancestors. He refers to George Fox, uh, uh, you know, what you might, the person whom you might describe as a founder of Quakerism, right? Um, and he cites in this book, the great American abolitionist who was a Quaker, William Lloyd um, uh, Garrison, right? He contrasts the Quakers with the Jacobits, uh, and says the spirit of Jacobinism is the spirit of retaliation, violence, and murder. And, and in the kingdom of God, what Tolstoy then does is a number of things. First is that he actually discusses what he thinks are the lost roots of Christianity, uh, as taught by, for example, as an illustration, a man called Adin Balo, uh, who had founded a nonviolent uh, community in Massachusetts, uh, in the 1840s that Tolstoy knew about. Uh, but principally, what Tolstoy is really saying is the following, and the kingdom of God is within you, that the teachings of Christ do not at all correspond to the teachings of the church, of the church, right? So, so what he wants to do is he wants to distinguish between institutionalized Christianity, which he sees as completely mired in corruption and more critically in violence, right? All right? And what he considers to be the teachings of Christ, which he says really are lost, right? And, and, and so he argues in this book that the love of the self is love of the God within you. To be a Christian is to forego the ego. And Tolstoy argues very forcefully here in this book that Christ imposes on us the law of nonviolence, right? And here's a here's a, a a a quotation which is really quite extraordinary. And then you'll see how I'll play with this and bring Gandhi in because he says Tolstoy says we must take the Sermon on the Mount to be as much a law, a law as the theorem of Pythagoras, end quote, right? And one of the most interesting things about Gandhi, again, deserving of a lengthy inquiry on its own, right, is the frequency with which Gandhi refers to Euclid, okay? And you know that if you look at Gandhi's English prose, 
in particular, you find that much of his English prose consists of very simple sentences, right? I mean, he was a master of the English language, but he didn't, you know, use a complicated syntax or use a complicated punctuation, you know, m dashes, semicolons, colons, not really. The simple statements almost given as propositions, almost given as what I might call metrical propositions. And, and just so that I can convince you that I'm not speaking in the air here, here are three quotations from Gandhi's writings. Uh, you, can, you can find all of them, by the way, in the anthology called Mind of Mahatma Gandhi. Um, although the references to Euclid are to be found in many of his other writings as well. Uh, Euclid's line is one without breath, but no one has so far been able to draw it and never will. Secondly, a second one, if Euclid's point, though incapable of being drawn by human agency, has an imperishable value, my picture has its own for mankind to live. And a third illustration, absolute trusteeship is an abstraction like Euclid's definition of a point, and it's equally unattainable, all right? So, so what I'm suggesting to you here is that you can see that kind of affinity between Gandhi and Tolstoy and the very way in which what both of them are really suggesting is that the law of nonviolence and the way in which one arrives at a certain understanding of nonviolence is like a scientific proposition. And, and this is all the more interesting because both Tolstoy and Gandhi have a rigorous critique of modern science, but not necessarily of the scientific method. Because one of the difficulties that Gandhi had with modern science was its inability to, ex to accept any other competing accounts. Right. That is to say that Western modern science, and here I'm using Western and modern here with reference to science as synonymous, claims that it has the sole prerogative of truth. What Gandhi is really interested in is the idea of plurality of sciences. All right. Um, and what I'm suggesting here is that this idea of the law of love, right, which is what Tolstoy is putting forward in this book as a scientific proposition is something that Gandhi himself, in turn, is going to come to accept. All right. Now, one can take a different approach because it is also the case that having read this book, this did not necessarily mean that Gandhi put its principles into practice, so to speak. All right. So, for example, if he read this book in 1894, and then he certainly read it again after 1906, all right? Now, you know, the law of non-resistance, right, that, that, that Tolstoy says uh, that what Christ's fundamental proposition is that we must be attentive to the law of non-resistance, Right, that this that Christ, Christianity that Christ, Christ imposes upon us the law of non-resistance. But yet, the fact of the matter is that Gandhi volunteers for three imperial wars. Right, so you've got you've got you've got the the Boer War of eighteen ninety eight, and then you've got the Zulu Rebellion of nineteen o six or Mambatha's Rebellion of nineteen o six, and then of course you have the so-called Great War of 1914-1918, where if you recall from the autobiography that Gandhi, you know, he's come back to India now, right? In early January 1915, and he's returned to India. Uh, and and Gandhi, in, uh, Gandhi insists on trying to recruit Indians for the war, even though this was not India's war. Britain obviously had dragged India into the war. And Gandhi himself says that he, he, he went about this task, task so tirelessly that he actually fell ill, you know, all right? So... In short, this book is a radical work of reinterpretation of Christianity. It signifies, number two, a fundamental shift in Tolstoy's own thinking. And number three, this work above all others in Tolstoy's canon of works is the one that Gandhi really takes to heart, right, for various reasons. And where you find various kinds of affinities between Tolstoy and Gandhi. Now, 
there is an exchange of correspondence between the two. This is what most scholars have really focused on. Uh, very few have actually looked at the kingdom of God is within you in any detail. Most of the scholars have focused on this correspondence. I'll go over it very briefly and then move to the Duco Wars because I'd like to take another 20 minutes to, to wrap up and then you know have time for a Q&A. Um, th in looking at the exchange of correspondence between Tolstoy and Gandhi, the story actually begins with Tarkana Das, uh, who is a member of the Anush Anushilan Samiti. This is literally a group uh, that comes up in Bengal, a late colonial Bengal, uh, when Bengalis uh, were trying to establish that, well, they were not that effeminate race that, that, that as, as they had been described uh, in the late 18th century by Robert Orme and then by people like Macaulay, but rather that, you know, that they, they, they were people who were muscular and who could respond in a muscular way to colonial rule, right? Because the idea also was that, well, you know, we as Indians are being, are being actually colonized because we are a feeble people. Um, so, so the Tarkana Das is a member of the Anushilan Samiti, which is also, it's not literally, as I said, a bodybuilding Jimkhana kind of group, but it is actually a secret society which also believes, whose members believe that armed revolutionary violence uh, is necessary against the British if India is going to become free of colonial rule. Uh, uh, the Anushilan Samiti and other similar groups were now uh, facing persecution by the British. Uh, and uh, its members began to scatter. One of its most famous members, of course, was Aurobindo Ghosh, or Sri Aurobindo, as he becomes known later on. Right. So Das leaves India uh, to escape persecution, fundamentally, really, and arrives in San Francisco in 1906 via Tokyo. Uh, he moves to Vancouver in 1908. Uh, because there he's being, he's he's finding some difficulties in trans San Francisco as well, and he founds a monthly called the Free Hindustan, modeled on a journal known as the Indian Sociologist, which was founded in 1905 by Krishna Verma, right? Who is uh, also a great advocate of armed revolutionary violence. He's a fellow Gujarati like Gandhi, Krishna Verma. Um, all right, uh, Krishna Varma is based in London. Now, both the journal founded by Tarkanad Das and the journal founded uh, by Krishna Varma have on their masthead two quotations from Herbert Spen Spencer. And I think that tells you volumes about Tarkanad Das and Krishna Verma, what kind of people they were. Because if you're familiar with Herbert Spencer, you know that he is the most prominent social advocate of social Darwinism. Uh, you know, a very rigid positivist thinker. Uh, I mean, if I had to really simplify it, I mean, he belongs to that school of thought which says, you know, might makes for right. Okay, I mean, as I said, with some simplification, it, there's nothing profound in that way of thinking, frankly. Um, but he became a highly influential person um, uh, in in um, um, the late uh, 19th century and remained so for many years, right? Um, uh, and these two quotations from Herbert Spencer that adorn the masthead of these two magazines are the following. Every man is free to do that which he wills, provided he infringes not the equal freedom of any other man. And secondly, resistance to aggression is not simply justifiable, but imperative. Non-resistance. And remember, Tolstoy says that Christ says the fundamental law is one of non-resistance. Non-resistance hurts both altruism and egoism, end quote. All right. In 1913, the Indian sociologist uh, you can so understand the tenor of this magazine. It carries an opinion piece critiquing Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence. So this is based on Gandhi's work in South Africa because Gandhi hadn't returned to India at this point in time. Um, and, and this critique, this piece says that his philosophy of nonviolence is utterly subversive of all ethical, political, and social ideals. All right. So this is the strand of thinking to which Tarkanath Das, Krishna Verma, and Savarkar belonged, all right? Savarkar, so Krishna Verma is one of the first people whom he is going to sponsor in London is Savarkar, all right? So that's where the Savarkar connection comes in as well, all right? 
Now, how did this exchange begin? I said the story begins with Tarkanath Das, all right? Um, and it begins in this fashion that Tarkanath Das is going to um, uh, uh, ad address a uh, letter to Tolstoy, all right, uh, where he's going to sort of ask him, you know, certain, you know, uh, questions about his politics and all of that. And Tolstoy responds with something called letter to a Hindu. All right, letter to a Hindu. Uh, this is this is the first primary document that we have. Uh, the the this exchange, by the way, uh, this is not addressed to Gandhi. It's it's really addressed to Tarkanath Das. But in a manner of speaking, it could have been so. It's, it's called Letter to a Hindu, and it's actually going to be published. And so, you know, in a man, in a manner of speaking, it could have been addressed as actually to to Gandhi, because the subject, the way in which Tolstoy wrote, it was as though he was writing to Gandhi. Uh, and of course, Tarkanath Das was completely taken aback by what Tolstoy had written, because he was not at all in favor of the kind of things that Tolstoy was advocating for, which I think should be clear from the remarks that I've already made um, uh, thus far. Um, now, in 1908, before this, Gandhi had actually sent Tolstoy his birthday greetings. You know, Tolstoy had received birthday greetings from a number of people around the world, and Gandhi was one of those people who had sent these greetings to him. Um, and shortly thereafter, this letter to a Hindu is placed in Gandhi's hands. It had been published somewhere. Gandhi was not sure about the source of this publication, whether this was really authentic, um, uh, you know, because the views that it expressed were views that Gandhi found himself in, in deep agreement with. All right. So he writes a letter to Tolstoy saying that, well, you know, this letter to a Hindu that you wrote has, has come into my hands and I would like to print 20,000 copies of this and I would like to circulate it. Uh, but I want to be sure that it's authentic and that it really is from your hands uh, and so on. All right. So what is a letter to a Hindu? It's basically a very thoughtful response by Tolstoy to this query that he had received from Tarkanath Das. Right? And, and in this, what Tolstoy says, he fulminates against what he calls civilization, which he defines as following the reproduction on that sacred soil of gun factories. All right. OK. And he's referring it to that sacred soil of India. All right, because he's saying to, to Tarkanath Das, you know, what the British have done is they have essentially desecrated your country. They have desecrated your country. He warns Das that India would cease to exist. It would cease to be if it followed the trajectory of what had been taken as a process of civilization in the West. He urges the path of nonviolent resistance and says if India doesn't follow that path, it will simply replicate and duplicate the barbarism of England on its own people later on. All right. And I would like to think about what is happening in India today, right? Because that is essentially what Tolstoy is really talking about over here, right? He suggests it. And you can see that this argument is going to be picked up by Gandhi and Hinswaraj, right? He suggests that England has been able to enslave 200 million Indians because Indians have become captive to the glitter of material civilization, to the values and ideals of Western civilization, because he says it is not possible to be colonized unless there is a pact between the colonizer and the colonized. And then he ends this letter to a Hindu by reaffirming that only through nonviolence can Hindus defeat the deeply immoral forms of social order in which the English and other pseudo moral Christian nations live today. And, and, and then he says something which Gandhi does not fundamentally agree with. This is, I think, the fundamental disagreement, but it's not sharp enough from, from Gandhi's standpoint for him to, to say that, well, I reject Tolstoy's you know, teachings or I have some serious misgives it because what he really says here is that what Hindus must give, give up Hinduism, just like Christians must give up Christianity because Christianity and the teachings of Christ are not the same thing, right? Remember, that that's, that's one of the principal arguments of the kingdom of God is within you because what, he, what Tolstoy argues is that there is only one thing that as human beings we must be attentive to, 
what he calls, quote, the simple, clear law of love accessible to everybody and solving all problems and all perplexities, end quote. Now, Gandhi was already on the verge of formulating all these ideas. And, and of course, Hind Swaraj is going to be written just momentarily later, months later, right? In 1909, which, as I've already pointed out, published early in 1910 in Gujarati, uh, the you know it's actually proscribed by the government of India. Then then Gandhi translates it into English, um, and it is this English translation of Hind Swaraj that Gandhi sends to Tolstoy. Right now, before he did that, he had sent to Tolstoy a biography of him. That is a biography of Gandhi that we know of. All right written in any language of Gandhi. This is by Reverend Joseph Doak, right? And so Gandhi sends a copy of this biography to Tolstoy and then months later follows it up with a copy of Hind Swaraj. And on April 20th of 1910, Tolstoy records in his diary, quote, in the evening read Gandhi about civilization. Wonderful, end quote. And it notes in his diary, quote, Gandhi is very close to us, to me, end quote. The Tolstoy biographers have not really noted this, all right, what Tolstoy is really saying about Hind Swaraj and about this book. Um, he also makes a notation in his diary about having read the biography of Gandhi and says, quote, read book about Gandhi, very important, I must write to him, which he does subsequently. Now, I can't replay the whole correspondence because there is a correspondence that goes on for a very short period of time. And you'll see why it was a very short period of time. Um, and on August 15th of that year, Gandhi actually describes to him Tolstoy Farm. In a previous letter, of course, what Gandhi had done is he had described to him the whole campaign in the Transvaal that he was undertaking, right? Transvaal in South Africa that he was undertaking on behalf of the rights of Indians, right? And he describes the Satyagra campaign because you remember that it was on September 11th, 1906, that Gandhi launched the first Satyagraha campaign, right? All right. So uh, 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 on September 7th, Tolstoy writes at greater length, the more I live, and especially now that I'm approaching death, he says, the more the enmity between love and violence, the antagonism between love and violence has struck him as the fundamental political and spiritual problem of the times. And he argues there that Christianity has failed fundamentally in being unable to resolve this tension between love and violence while pretending that it is actually possible for both of them to be rendered compatible, right? Um, and Gan Tolstoy writes to Gandhi saying that your work in the Transvaal is most fundamental and important and the quote, most weighty practical proof of the law of love and non-resistance. Now this correspondence terminates shortly thereafter because Tolstoy dies the same year in 1910, all right? He did have one fundamental reservation at that point, and it's a very interesting one. Um, and perhaps in the Q&A, if somebody had a question, we, I could elaborate upon it greater, where, where he says that Gandhi's nationalism spoils it all, right? That this is the only part of it, he says, you know, of the work that he's doing. Uh, and I think, and what he's referring to in particular is Hind Swaraj uh, and some of the kinds of statements that Gandhi had made, which uh, Tolstoy found fundamentally um, uh, unacceptable. Now, let me turn to a very different chapter of this. All right. And then end with some thoughts on what all of this really signifies. All right. And here I want to turn to a group of people known as the Duco Boris, right? The, this is, and so this is a, a radical anarchist community also known as the Spirit Wrestlers. Their story has been little told. Their social history is not very well known. I mean, it's some, a few scholars here and there have worked on it. And even chroniclers of nonviolent resistance, global history of nonviolent resistance are unfamiliar with them. For example, there is no mention of the Duke of Boris and Peter Ackerman and Jack Duval's book, uh, 
a force more powerful, a century of nonviolent resistance, which basically looks at all the major forms of nonviolent resistance around the world, but um, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, doesn't mention the Duke of Wars at all. Or in Mark Orlansky's short but engaging book, Nonviolence, 25 Lessons from the History of a Dangerous Idea, published in 2006. Uh, these Duke of Wars arose from the great 17th century schism that shook Russia. And it's a mystical evangelical group. And from 1773 onwards, they've intermittently faced persecution uh, from the czarist regimes, right? Uh, the, what, what are some of the elements of the Dukobo worldview? So as I mentioned to you, uh, some of the scholars have suggested that they can be viewed as sort of the Russian equivalent of the Quakers in some ways. Uh, it's possible that some of the Dukobors knew of the writings of George Fox. Uh, but what is very clear is that like the Quakers, the Dukobors, while viewing them right, as the true exponents of the teachings of Christ, they reject all external authority, even the Bible in some instances, and viewed their own leader as a reincarnation of Christ, right? Uh, this uh, convoluted uh, history uh, of the Duke of Boris, I say convoluted because then we'd have to look at all the intermittent forms of oppression, persecution, uh, the various stratagems that they used uh, over a period of 150 years, right? Uh, for example, one of the one of the things that they constantly had to struggle with was the whole problem of conscription, because the Duke of Boris were committed to a form of radical nonviolence. Uh, so non-resistance, really, frankly, uh, in, in Christian or Tolstoyan terms, they were committed to egalitarianism, vegetarianism, communal ownership of proper, property. You can see, by the way, again, trust Gandhi's trusteeship, vegetarianism, uh, uh, and of course, the repudiation, as I've already mentioned, of conscription. Uh, and one of the ways in which they're going to respond, and this is the way one of the ways in which the oppressed very often respond is, is uh, uh, by removing themselves into into exile, right? So they began to scatter themselves to various places, and the you know, Russian Empire was really vast. Very often, they would exile themselves to the remoter parts of the empire, and the hope that the that the czar's authority, his writ, would not run that much in the more in the more extreme parts. Uh, they scattered to villages in Georgia, uh, uh, but where they come into this story is in two fundamental respects, all right? The first is that it is Tolstoy who is going to sponsor their massive migration to Canada, all right? Which is where now you find the largest community of Dukobors in the world. So he sponsors their migration to, to Canada and some of his fiction, including a book called Resurrection, a very late work, is written with the express purpose of actually being able to get enough royalties. And he used that money with which he actually sponsored their migration to, to Canada. All right. Um, uh, and just so that you have an idea, we are talking about a relatively small community. I mean, in Canada, uh, there are about 25,000 some Dukobor settled mainly in Western uh, uh, Canada. There are about 5,000 or so uh, in, in the United States. Uh, in Russia, no one really knows, uh, but the estimate is anywhere from a few thousand to something like perhaps 30,000. So the two largest populations may be Canada and Russia, but certainly Canada, because Russia, we're not really quite, uh, quite sure. All right. Um, um, there are some scholarly studies. Now, here's the second more is most interesting thing. So the two things that they're most well known for, all right, the Dukovors, um, is one, that when they were called to conscription, as I, as I said, you know, they devised various stratagems for trying to not have to fight uh, because they were fundly, fundamentally opposed to the use of violence, right? Uh, one of the things that they began to do is they began to enact a ritual burning of firearms, all right? Now, I say ritual because most Dukobors didn't have firearms. So there were only very few, but there were some who had had firearms for a very long period of time. 
uh, you know, the families that had had firearms and some of their teachers had already pointed out, I mean, some of their, their spiritual teachers, I mean, that this, that owning firearms was completely contrary to the principles of what they stood for to begin with. Uh, but, you know, there, but, but one of the problems that the Dukov was constantly encountered was that the Tsars would let loose the Cossacks on them. I and mean, if you read anything about the Cossacks, uh, I mean, I would recommend the novels of Jerzy Kozinski, by the way, uh, you know, as a way to get some handle on the Cossacks, but the, but the levels of brutality to which these people were capable, the Cossacks was extraordinary. And one of the things that the Tsarist regime very often did was they would quarter um, the, the Cossacks on the Dukobor population. So, you know, the Dukobors had to actually feed these, the, their very own oppressors who were living with them. That's what it means to quarter them, right? Uh, so, but for these reasons, there were still firearms in the community. And so every year what they do did was they gathered the firearms and they would make a bonfire of them and they burn them. And they've been doing that every year in Canada ritually. So this is one of their ways to signify their 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 uh, opposition uh, to the uh, private ownership of arms. Uh, not that they monopoly, but that no one should have, you know, firearms at all. Secondly, their most characteristic way of actually engaging in dissent is they strip themselves naked, completely naked, men and women, and they march through a town. They march through a town, all right? Um, and of course, I'm not suggesting to you that Gandhi's own embrace of nakedness, remember that what Gandhi says on many different occasions, my ambition in life is to reduce myself to zero. Shunyata. My ambition in life is to become naked, utterly naked, because to become naked is to shorn yourself of all your ego, is to lay bare the truth. Right? And of course, there is a there is a way in which we can write a sartorial history of Gandhi, how he began his adult life overdressed. And, you know, you've all read how he was dressed when he went to London and when he initially went to South Africa, and then how he gradually peels off clothes. And finally, in Madurai in 1921, adopts what becomes his trademark dhoti. And last 20 years, most of the time, the photographs you see of Gandhi is going around completely bare chested. All right. Lots of reasons. There's a whole politics and a whole metaphysics of nakedness here. Right? And I'm suggesting to you, of course, that I'm not suggesting that Gandhi learned this from the Duke of nothing of that kind, really. Although it must be said that he was actually aware of them, right? That is really the most extraordinary thing because in this classic account of his years in South Africa, Satyagra in South Africa, uh, published in 1928, he writes, quote, and I quote, Jesus Christ indeed has been acclaimed as the prince of passive resistors, but I submit in that case, passive resistance must mean Satyagra and Satyagra alone. There are not many cases in history of passive resistance in that sense. One of these is that of the Duko Bors of Russia cited by Tolstoy, end quote, page 106. All right, so Gandhi knew of the Duke of Boris here, right? And I'm suggesting that there is a kind of, if a shared history of ideas here, okay? Where if you look at Tolstoy, the Duke of Boris and Gandhi, one begins to see the larger possibilities of what the title describes as radical nonviolence and anarchism. Because here, and this moves me to my conclusion now, what, is really gained by thinking about Tolstoy, Gandhi, and the Duke of Bursa, all right? right? I mean, what is this intellectual exercise about? Well, the first, you could say that this is an exercise in the intellectual history of ideas. How, how is it that people across different generations, different contexts, across time and space, have a certain shared affinity for certain forms of thinking? Very simply, one could put it that way, right? It, Right? Secondly, of course, in the exchange between Tolstoy and Gandhi, we have one of the great intellectual exchanges of the 20th century. I don't think it has really been recognized as such. I mean, as I said, the Gandhi biographers are aware of this exchange, but they usually think of it simply as 
trying to understand what Tolstoy's influence was really on Gandhi. It's not a matter of influence here. It's a matter of how a certain worldview, a worldview which is deeply based on an understanding of the profundity of the law of love and that violence can in no form or shape ever be compatible with this, right? That is radical nonviolence. And this is what this intellectual exchange is really about. So it's also about the history of ideas. It's about speaking across borders and cultures. It's about the possibilities of interculturality and all of that, right? Then there is also the fact that, as I said, Gandhi and Tolstoy come to it from very different ends. You know, and it is not only, of course, Christ, it's not only uh, uh, Tolstoy's more polemical or didactic or non-fictional writings, writing such as The Kingdom of God is Within You, which exemplify these ideas. That's why I mentioned the novel Resurrection uh, or the short stories, right, which also point to really the same point of view. So he's still coming to it really as a, as a writer, as a novelist, as a short story writer, as a fiction writer, right, which is not how Gandhi is coming, coming to this, right. Then there is a question of why and in what among the most important thinkers of the 20th century came to harbor a profound suspicion of the state, of the state. And this is what anarchism means. Of course, here, anarch anarchism doesn't mean what politicians very often claim it to be, absence of law and order. You know, when, when uh, uh, Donald Trump in the U.S. Uh, describes the radical, you know, anarchists, of course, he's completely witless, uh, has no idea what he's really talking about because he simply is using this in the same sense that very people often think about. Anarchism here is a devolution of authority, right? Devolution of power, a deep, as I said, profound suspicion of the state. Right? But what is interesting is that their profound suspicion of the state does not come from the classical liberal tradition. That's usually that suspicion of the state we associate with the classical liberal tradition. But Tolstoy and Gandhi cannot be located really within that tradition. In fact, they are profoundly critical of the liberal tradition as well, right? Okay, so how they came to advocate a radical nonviolence that conceived of nonviolence as the highest expression of love is, I think, the most interesting takeaway from looking at Tolstoy and Gandhi together. And finally, my last comment, perhaps the most intriguing testament of how Gandhi and Tolstoy are joined at the hip comes from a work of fiction. Not by Tolstoy, of course, but a much later work of fiction, a work that became immensely popular in its own time. I'm referring here to Arthur Kessler's book, novel, Darkness at Noon, which most people imagine was written in English. Uh, and and um, I forget whether it was a BBC or some other you know, major media outlet uh, described it as among the hundred greatest novels written in English. Well, it was not. It wasn't written in English, by the way. It was written in German, and it was translated into English uh, immediately after it was written. It's set in 1939. The novel is published in 1940, uh, and it casts a critical look or at at Bolshevism and totalitarianism. You know, both at both at Stalin, really, although Stalin is of course not named, uh, and at Hitler's Germany, and Hitler is not named either, of course, because it's a work of fiction. And this work of fiction concerns a, a, a major character called Rubashov, uh, who is an old Bolshevik, right? So the, the, the belonging to that strand of Bolsheviks who had been responsible for creating the great Bolshevik or the great October Revolution of 1917 that brought the Bolsheviks and Lenin to power. But now, of course, these same Bolsheviks were all being persecuted by, by Stalin, right? So this is an old, he's an old time Bolshevik who's being tried for treason in this novel, right? This is the character. Uh, and and the, the new communists, that is the real communists that as Stalin saw them, um, uh, uh, are, are the ones who are going to unleash this, uh, you know, this political show trial as it were, right? Uh, how popular this novel is can be gauged also by the fact that Bob Levin, 
um, has a wonderful song. It's called It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Bleeding, uh, which and the first line of that song is darkness at the break of noon. Unquestionably a reference to this book, I would say. So why do I bring this book in? Because, and I'm going to quote with, conclude with this quotation. Now, the new communist persecuting the old Bolshevik says, and I quote, the greatest criminals in history are not the type of Nero or Fouché. Fouché was a minister of police under Napoleon Bonaparte. All right. So let me repeat that again. The greatest criminals in history are not the type of Nero or Fouché, but of the type of Gandhi and Tolstoy. Gandhi's inner voice has done more to prevent the liberation of India than the British guns. To want to conduct history according to the maxims of the Sunday school means to leave everything as it is, end quote. And this suggests, this quotation, this fictional character saying Gandhi and Tolstoy are the greatest enemies suggests exactly why these two people are among the most important people to think with. Thank you.